It's Sunday, February 4, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is a former MAGA Republican and Trump voter who changed her mind about the disgraced former president and is now a Democrat and pro-democracy activist here on the Midas Touch Network. Ali Samarco, welcome to The Weekend Show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, I, I'm so impressed by the videos that you put out and how, you know, on, on TikTok and various platforms, you're really trying to kind of to communicate to young people, especially. And uh, that is an area that, that definitely Democrats need to reach to make people, you know, realize that, that, that Democrats are, are not the, <laughs> what do they call them? Radical Marxists that, that some of the kind of MAGA people might have them think is the case. Mm -hmm. Just tell us, before we kind of get into the weeds of, of the, you know, where we're at now, just tell us a little bit about your story. About, you know, how old were you when you, you know, I presume it was maybe your first vote voting for Donald Trump. Is that right? Mm -hmm. How that came about, you were living in Virginia, I think. So the people around you and just a little bit of the story to explain to people about how you managed to get out of the cult of Trump. Yeah. So it starts when I was pretty young. Um, I was born and raised in Northern Virginia. So I've always been in a very politically active environment, I guess. Um, and so I was taken to politics right away. I just loved learning about our government and how it worked. And so I got, I, I would say it started like from my parents. That's like the biggest source of information that I think a young kid gets their information from. So I got a lot of my information and my views from my dad at the time. Um, and I would just ask him questions about what was going on and he would give me his take. And I took that as fact obviously, as a young kid does. And uh, we would spend hours and hours in the car listening to conservative talk radio. Um, we went on a number of road trips. I was playing travel sports. So it was just hours and days of conservative talk radio. So it was Rush Limbaugh. Um, it was Sean Hannity, Mark Levin, all those types. And a lot of the time they were talking about, I think it was early 2010. So it was during the Obama presidency. They were talking about how Obama was um, secretly a Muslim or secretly part of the Muslim Brotherhood. He, uh, Michelle Obama was secretly a man as well. Um, all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories that they believed and they were echoing out to their audiences. And so as a young kid, I'm hearing this stuff and I'm like, oh my gosh, well, this is crazy, you know? Um, and so naturally I'm like, Obama should not be president. Democrats should not be in charge. Um, there was a number of other conspiracy theories too, like that the Sandy Hook shooting was fake, um, things like that. And so I was wanting to be involved and as active as I could, as soon as I could. So um, I was volunteering for Republicans. I was knocking doors when I was 14 years old. Mm. <laughs> Most kids are playing with their friends. I was out knocking doors. Um, making phone calls. I interned at the Republican Party headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. And uh, um, I was part of my my local Republicans club at my high school. And so I was all in. I was I thought Republicans were the the family party, family, family values, the small um, business, the America loving party. I mean, that's how they brand themselves. And so I in my mind, Democrats were evil. They had to be defeated. They were liars. They were they were out to destroy the country. And so um, I was 100 percent in on the mission. I was working towards that um, in my in my free time. And then I did go to college in 2019 or no, sorry, 2015, 2015, um, I graduated in 2019. And uh, um, during my time in college, I think as most people do, you kind of you're more focused on what you're doing day to day. You're less focused on what's going on in the country. And so I was like, I'm going to tune out for a little bit, um, like as soon as I got there. And then the next year came around, Donald Trump announced his presidency. I was like, not really sure. I wasn't, I was not sold on him at all. I was like, I don't know. I know of him. I don't know what he stands for really. 
Um, I had seen a couple clips of him talking, debating. I'm like, I just don't really think this guy is fit to be a president. So um, I was, you know, keeping up with the primary. I eventually locked in on Ted Cruz who I thought was a better champion of conservative values. <laughs> wow. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, it's funny to look back on now and yeah. laugh and see how far some of these people have fallen. It was, it was between Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio at the time. So I was kind of locked in on Ted. Um, and I didn't really understand the appeal about Trump. I remember asking my dad what he thought. And he said, you know, Ali, I think people just really want a disruptor. They want someone who's an outsider who's going to come in and shake up the whole system. And so I'm like, okay, dad, you know, I totally understand that. I just don't really think this is the guy necessarily. So um, I voted for Ted Cruz in the primaries early 2016. Obviously, he ended up losing. Um, Donald Trump became the nominee. And I had a choice. And I was like, I don't think there's a universe where I could potentially go out and vote for a Democrat. It's just not going to happen. When you think the other side is evil and out to destroy the country, there's, there's no shot. You like, you, you can't even fathom crossing party lines to vote for that, that other person. And I think that's a lot of what's happening today. I mean, yeah, that, that is actually my biggest concern is that even though people recognize that Donald Trump is, disgraced and is a you know and has all of these legal issues now and and everything else especially taking ownership of the reversal of roe i still think it's very hard for people to put a a, a cross in in the biden box in the democrat box and and that shift is something that i'm interested to kind of know from you is how how you kind of crossed over let me just ask you, when you were in the car with your dad and you were listening to Rush Limbaugh and all that, so much of the stuff they say is so negative. It's so angry. There's so much hatred and, you know, hate speech. Did you feel, did you become like an angry kid? Like, did it, did it have an effect on you? Because my concern with a lot of Republicans as adults is that they're, they can't be very happy people. You know, there is a lot of anger and dissatisfaction and, and, it does not make for a, you know a peaceful existence, really. Yeah, um, I think that you can see that play out with a lot of adults these days. I mean, as a kid, you're kind of I don't know. You're assessing what people are saying. You're assessing what you're experiencing day to day. And I felt like the, what these people were saying was true, and then I had an avenue to express my my support for them and my you know discussed with the current ruling party, the Democrats at the time. So I think that anger can quickly turn into, you know, action. You can, because there is a party that is willing to take that anger and channel it into voting, into volunteering, into working for the party. So that's what I was doing. Right. I think there are adults who don't want to take that avenue. So they just end up stewing and, you know, being hateful on social media and things like that. Um, but the problem is, is that the Republican Party embraces that hatred and they take it. Yeah, and they, 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 say, they use it. Us. Yeah, yes. I, I understand. So let me just ask a little bit about your, your family background. How did your dad become so, you know, uh, would you say he was politically active, activated? Mm -hmm. Was he somebody that you kind of looked up to from that perspective? And and what was his kind of voting history? Was was he, you know, very much rooted in republicanism? And, and you know, were, were you a religious family? How did it come about? That's the funny thing. We weren't really a religious family. Um, we had gone to church maybe a handful of times when I was a young kid. So... There wasn't that aspect, but I did feel like if I had to align with someone, it would be the Christian right. Um, and so I do think a lot of people feel that way too. Like they may not be going to church, they may not be active in their religious community, but they feel if they had to, they would align with the Christian right or evangelicals. So there's still that loyalty there for some reason, even if you're not living out that day to day. Um, but my dad, he was, I mean, lifelong conservative. He grew up in a very small town in New York, um, hard worker. He left, he paid for college himself. 
he left, um, moved away from home, moved to DC, got a job with the CIA actually. And then now he has his own business. So I think he always felt like he kind of lived the American dream and he busted his butt and got to where he is today. And then he was hearing, you know, Democrats say stuff like we have privilege or white men have privilege, which is true. But for him, he couldn't see that, you know, it was like, well, I've worked so hard to get to where I am today. And uh, so I think that was a big catalyst to why he ended up aligning more with the Republican Party. Um, But he was, yeah, he was very involved, active voter, watched the news a lot. So that's where I got I think that's where I got a lot of my um, inclinations from. What's your relationship with him like now? How how have you, since you've taken on the, the, you know, you've opened your mind to liberal and progressive and inclusive policies. What's your relationship like with your your parents and your family now? Yes. So um, my relationship with my father is very good. Um, We have come to disagree or agree to disagree on certain topics, but we always keep um, respect towards each other. And uh, I did convince him. So he he did vote for Donald Trump in 2016 and then again in 2020. I tried very hard to change his mind in 2020 (laughs) and I was not successful. So I had a we had a little bit of a rough patch there. Um, We were kind of, you know, at each other's throats a little bit. So took a break during that period. And I think a lot of people did actually with their families because it was just too much to even talk about. Um, But in 2021, I was working for Terry McAuliffe in the Virginia governor's race. And I did convince him to vote for Terry. So I was very happy about that um, because Glenn Youngkin obviously ended up winning and he was very appealing to a lot of Republican voters. So, um, but I was happy. I got my dad to cross party lines there. Probably some of it had to do that with the fact that I was working for Terry McAuliffe, but um, I felt like that was a a big step. And uh, he has told me since that day, we've talked um, quite a bit and he's told me that he does not trust Donald Trump after January 6th. He, I think he kind of saw where where we were headed as a country. And I wanted him to see it earlier, obviously, just a few months earlier. Um, but I think that was enough proof that he didn't like where we were headed with Donald Trump in charge. And so now he has committed to not voting for Donald Trump um, if he's the nominee. That does not mean he will vote for Joe Biden. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, he's mm. looking at the no labels party, unfortunately, but um, Which is also Donald Trump, effectively. Right. That's yeah. what I'm trying to tell him. Yeah. Um, but he does, he really liked Chris Christie in the um, Republican primary and was sad when he dropped out. Yeah. Um, I have so many things to ask you because, you know, okay. it's so hard to actually be able to engage with people who've made this journey and crossed over. Because a lot of people either are in denial or refuse to, or if they have, they're doing it quietly and they don't want anybody to know. Mm -hmm. So I want to come back to how we can help other people with this, you know, with this journey. But firstly, what was the trigger for you? What, what, What changed your mind? What was that period where you... Because it's a big leap to go from the far right to the left, isn't it? You know, it's like mm-hmm. you were, if you were embedded in that kind of Christian nationalist, evangelical space, it's a long way to come to a kind of liberal, progressive, and hopefully inclusive political viewpoint. Yeah, no, it is. Um, I think the best way I can describe it is once the curtain is lifted and you see the party for what it is, you see Donald Trump for who he is. There's no going back, you know, it's like your eyes are open and now you can see everything for, for what it truly is. And so that was why I took such a hard left to the democratic party, because I felt like I had been lied to. Um, I had believed everything that they were saying, all the values that they said they supposedly supported. And when they elected someone like Donald Trump, who I did support for his election in 2016. Um, but in my mind, I thought, well, he's going to have people around him in the in the White House that will keep him contained. You know, he's going to have people that are going to be directing his policy, um, like the direction of his policies. And uh, that didn't happen, obviously. Well, he, he did, but they, they were Nazis. So right. <laughs> that didn't right. help. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he hired people that were just as crazy as he was. Yeah. 
or people that if they disagreed with him, he would, he would just fire them yeah. or tarnish them. So once I saw him in office, I was like, this is not what I wanted or signed up for. I knew this when I voted for Ted Cruz in the primary and now it's just coming to fruition. And so, um, I felt like I had been lied to. I felt like how could they still be supporting this man? Um, after like all of this stuff that he is, he has enacted or done so far in office and all the things he had done before he even got into office, you know, his scams, his fraud, his, his business, um, his business scams like Trump university, um, or things like that. So I was, I was angry. Um, and then it really wasn't until COVID came around and everyone was at home. Um, I spent a lot more time, you know, day to day seeing what was going on in the world, seeing how Trump was handling the COVID emergency. And I was not happy about it at all. I mean, I, I think any normal person would look at his response and say, well, it didn't make any sense. He was, yeah. you know, he was lying to the public about how dangerous it was. He was not encouraging mask wearing. And I felt like this is a tragedy in our country that that could bring our country together or it could tear us apart. And he was enabling the country to be torn apart. And so, I mean, I already knew at that point, but that was just the final nail in the coffin. I was not supporting him ever again. I was also not supporting the Republican Party ever again. That's so interesting, isn't it? Because really, you know, the pandemic did not discriminate no. politically. And yet he made it about politics. And, and he could have brought everybody to, to, together. He could have actually made the country more kind of pro-Trump. He could have actually mm -hmm. turned that around and, and been the kind of the, the great leader, you know, wartime leader in, in, this, in this pandemic period. And he, dro he dropped the ball significantly. And I, it was, I think it was unfortunate that there was an election the same year that meant that he couldn't choose between pandemic and election. For him, it was all about winning at, at whatever cost. And we know how that story ended. Um, mm -hmm. were, there, were there any, as you talk about the lies, I'm very interested in the lies because so much of what Republicans say, and we hear this channel through Fox News and through you know, conservative media, it's not based in fact, is it? I mean, it would be fine if it was, you know, it would be fine if there were really radical Marxists trying to destroy the country or you know, or, 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 or Democrats wanting to kill babies at nine months of pregnancy. I mean, any of this stuff is simply untrue. And yet that seems to be the whole kind of policy platform. It's just based on lies. I mean, how did you feel? Did you have a strong opinion about, about a woman's right to choose? Because I obviously think for women that is imperative. And I'm interested in how it is for, for, for young women as well. The fact that men are trying to control the narrative on, on, on women, this idea of control um, yeah. is something that I, that really chimes with me. I'm like, wow, like you must hate women if, if this is the position you take. Yes. There's nothing in the Bible that talks about abortion. So, you know, this is, this is a, this is a new thing, albeit, you know, many years old now. Yes. I think. Um, I don't know that I would ever say I was fully pro-life. I think I had always been um, erring towards the sides of pro-choice and because I am a woman, have been a woman. Um, so I, I think once I left the party, I, I saw the issue and I learned more about the issue. Um, I read books about the issue. I, you know, like once you learn the real facts behind women's mortality rates or, or, miscarriages or stillborn rates and things like that, you understand why we, why we're pro-choice, why we have, you know, laws that allow women to make that decision for themselves. Um, it's not just about, you know, not wanting a kid. There's plenty of other factors that go into it and everyone's situation is different. And so I felt like that actually was a huge issue for me because once Donald Trump was elected, it kind of like lifted the curtain. He has paid for abortions. He's paid off a porn star. He's, you know, cheated on his wives. Um, so to me, I'm like, if you really truly care about women and you truly care about this issue, you wouldn't be supporting a man like this. Um, and they, and they were. So to me, it said, you don't care about women. You know, you don't care about women's rights. You care, or you don't care about the lives of a, of a baby and the mother. Like 
you don't truly care. You're just, this is a political tool that you're using to gain power over women. Um, so I can think of other examples too, but it's, it was a lot of the hypocrisy that came from the man that they were supporting to be the president of the United States that let me say like, this is, this is clearly not what you guys support and you've been lying about it. Let's talk about the, the hypocrisy in these circles for a minute, because I heard on one of your videos, you talking about you went to Trump's inauguration mm -hmm. and you witnessed this kind of very machismo thing where you felt that men were kind of joining the Trump movement because it made them feel like men when in fact, potentially a lot of them were gay. And, the, and actually there's this kind of, and I've heard this from multiple places and I have friends in Florida who talk about this a lot. They're like, yeah, this is so weird. We have all these, it's like there's no gay people around in, in central Florida. And it's like, well, actually a lot of the married men are secretly gay and having secret relationships with other married men. And it's all on the download. And ultimately, no one is living their true life. No one, and, and they're campaigning against gay rights. It's, a, it's a, just an awful way to live. Tell me about your experience of that and how the, you know, the pressures maybe of, of this far right version of Christianity really is like an emotional blackmail for a lot of people. Yeah. I think um, it's a huge issue in the Republican Party because. Men, first of all, they a lot of them were were raised and grew up in families that were very religious or of a certain religion. And so from a young age, they were taught what's right and what's wrong. And I knew a ton of them that grew up with this mentality. And so they whatever personal feelings they had, they pushed down, um, you know, because it's wrong and that's what they believed. And they also knew that they would be publicly ostracized if they were to come out and say this. Um, and so they doubled down on what their beliefs were and they're working for this party because of their own self, you know, embarrassment about who they truly are. And so um, a lot of them, the most conservative ones, the, the ones that were the most homophobic were the ones that were actually hiding their, their true sexual preference. And, you know, on the side, on our side, it's like, we don't care, you know, like if you're gay, you're gay. like, come and be gay, you know? Um, but it's the ones that are like, that are actively pushing for legislation to harm that LGBTQ community. And secretly they are, you know, doing whatever it is they want to do in their free time. And so that is the biggest source of hypocrisy for me because, and it's the most insidious because, you know, you're, you're, you're not an ally and you're actively harming this community that you're actually a part of. We, we do hear stories in, you know, hitting the headlines about these people who eventually get unmasked. The former head of Liberty University, for example, is just one I can think of. Mm -hmm. But it, it does mean that this kind of plays into what I was saying earlier about the unhappiness and you know, dissatisfaction and anger and just not being able to express yourself and be yourself and, taking on these kind of weird political issues that don't have any place in reality. To me, as a, as a European living in the US, I, I see America as, as like, firstly, I see it as 50 countries, not one country, right? So, so there's very much a sense that you can be a completely different person in a different state. And, and, that, and at least we still have that. <laughs> you still have that freedom if you can afford to relocate. But, but secondly, I get a sense that there is this parallel universe where people are putting on a front, you know, conservative women all trying to look perfect and, and having the being very well turned out and trying to give the impression that, you know, life is, 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 is pure, whiter than white in some cases. And there isn't therefore room for minorities or, or, you know, social groups that they might not accept. So, so, how did you feel witnessing and being around people yeah. who were not being their their true selves? Did you feel like a a desire to kind of help people to you know did any of this kind of play a part in your eventual decision to kind of jump jump ship into reality? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I felt a desire to help them. I think um they're going to have to figure that out for themselves yeah. and you know, as we all do. So 
Um, I think I was just frustrated um, because it feels like, like I said, like it felt like white men have an allegiance to white men um, at the end of the day. And so anything that threatens their power dynamic, which is even just, you know, gay people having the right to marry or women having the right to vote or even just women, you know, working their way up in in society and being able to hold positions of power, like CEOs of major financial institutions. I feel like I saw these men that were very threatened by that. Um, and I think that in their minds, they have a picture of how the world in the United States is supposed to look and how it's supposed to be. And there was once upon a time when it was that way and life was great and grand. And obviously that is not true. And it's just a mythical vision that these people have of of the world. And so I think that they feel as though like they can achieve getting back to that place um, if they, you know, work hard enough and be hard enough. So. And is that what um, MAGA is? Is that, is that, does that yeah. really define MAGA? To make America great again is actually to make America white again. Yeah. And to go back to a time when minorities were hidden away and ignored or marginalized yeah. and, and, and where, where black and brown people were segregated and where gay people had to live in the shadows for fear of being attacked or even murdered. I mean, is that what MAGA really means? Yeah, I think whether they want to admit it or not, that is what it means to them. And that was how I felt at the time when I was, you know, working for the party and part of the party. It was the Democrats want to turn this country into something that it's not. And they want to keep changing the institutions that have worked for so long and have um, made this country what it is and how great it is. And so, yeah, I do think that they they in their mind, there was like I said, mythical old days where there were no gay people, there was no transgender people, you know, yeah. and minorities didn't, weren't so loud and vocal and, and fighting for their rights. And it's, the truth is, is that these people were pushed down. They were in, in the closet per se, like they were hiding because of the public, you know, scrutiny and ostracization that they might have. So, I mean, there really was never a a time or a period where America was truly great because there's always been a class of people that have been um, marginalized. And so, yeah, I mean, to them, life was great. Life was grand for for them, how it might have been for them if they're a white, rich man. But that's not the case for almost every other class of people. It's a very sad story, isn't it? That, you know, no matter how we try to intellectualize this subject, it always comes back to racism. And, the, mm -hmm. you know, fundamentally, the United States was you know, built on this kind of racist ideal that, that the white man was supreme. And I'm very interested in this, you know, really getting to the bottom of what MAGA really means. Because, you know, I've been saying for years that it, it's make America white again. But to actually hear, to hear somebody who was in that world acknowledge that really that's what they're saying. It's 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 very sad indictment of of you know how far we haven't actually come, and that yeah. and the, and how much more work there is to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we 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 need to take a quick pause for our sponsor, but I, I want to come back and talk to you about how we can help other people make that make that uh, journey that you did in in just a moment here on the weekend show. 10 seconds on the clock, how many things can you name that are always growing? Your relationships, your skills, your customer base? How about businesses on Shopify? When we started podcasting, an online store was the furthest thing from our minds. Now we're selling t-shirts and Midas Touch merch, and it's so easy, all because we use Shopify. <coughs> Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch of your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the, did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're delivering daily digests or serving sensational scoops, Shopify will help you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person point-of-sale system, 
Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds and Rothneys and Brooklinen and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's extensive help resources are there to support your success at every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash weekend. Go to shopify.com slash weekend now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash weekend. Are you self-conscious about your smile due to stains? Are your teeth aging you? Food and drink are known to stain teeth, coffee, wine, they stain over time. So what can you do to brighten your smile? Well, you should give Smile Actives a try. Smile Actives is safe, effective, easy to use, and will keep you smiling proudly. I personally have been to a dentist and had a teeth whitening treatment. It was painful, it was uncomfortable, and it was not a experience that I would want to repeat. Well, simply add Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. Do it at home. It's been formulated with PolyClean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into teeth's grooves to get better whitening. People will start commenting on your whiter, brighter smile in just days. Smile Actives is the whitening boost your favorite toothpaste needs to give you the smile you deserve. Visit smileactives.com slash weekend today to receive a special buy one, get one free offer with auto delivery plus shipping and handling. That's smileactives.com slash weekend. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. We're back with Ali Samarco here on The Weekend Show. I'm Anthony Davis. So we're just getting our heads around the idea that that the, the reality is the stuff that people don't say out loud. And, and that is, you know, when when you see videos of people at Trump rallies and they're asked, you know, what do you what do you want from Trump? Oh, I want to make America great again. What they're actually saying is I want to go back to a time when there was none of this trans stuff and there was none of this gay stuff and there was none of this, you know, neurodivergent stuff or ADHD or or you know, black people taking positions of authority, which is why so many people struggled with Barack Obama's you know, presidency, obviously. Exactly. And and to to getting to a point to understand that America can only be great if it is if it tries to be equal. And that, you know, countries, other countries around the world who really do embrace diversity and inclusivity and have become in, truly integrated are better for it, you know. And maybe there is an argument to say that what America hasn't yet worked out is that women are actually far smarter than men, and that and that you know women have, you know, in, instincts and emotional intelligence on a level that simply makes them better at many many things, and that men's track record is not great, and and. How do you feel about that side of it? Do you feel from just from a talking about the 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 minorities being marginalized, but how do you feel as a female coming from an environment where women are marginalized, where women are invariably taking a, a second place behind men? Yeah, I mean, I think today in today's world, it's hard to look at society and say, well, men have these rights that women don't have, because that's for the most part, that is not the case anymore. But I think it's, we need to consistently be thinking about how it was not long ago. It was probably 40, 50 years ago where women couldn't open bank accounts. Women couldn't open credit cards, you know, and uh, that is not that long ago. My, my mother was alive during that period. And so for People born in the 80s and 90s, they, they can't really grasp how history is is much closer than we think it is. And so there's always more work to be done um, to reach a, like a place where 
in society, women are socially um, on the same level, like professionally on the same level, politically on the same level. You look at the Republican Party in Congress, there's only a handful of women in the Senate and in the House. And so that right there is, I mean, it's the Republican Party, but it's it's proof enough that women still have work to do. We need to be fighting to have equal representation everywhere we are. And so, um, I mean, that's not lost on me. Um, and I also don't want to ever um, look back and, and think that we have just gotten these rights because they it just happens that way, because justice just bends towards, um, you know, we just are towards justice. Justice. That's not how it works. Um, people have fought and died and um, to protect our rights and to gain rights for women. And a lot of the times it's been in spite of the Republican Party and not because of them. And so when I see women in the Republican Party saying, well, we've had all these advancements and we've had all these rights um, that women have gained. I mean, were you fighting for them? Were, were the people in your party fighting for them? No, it was a lot of Democrats. It was feminists who were fighting for women's rights. So um, I don't want that ever to be lost on people that, you know, the women that came before us have allowed us to be where we are today. And we need to keep fighting. You know, this stuff doesn't just happen. It takes work and it takes um, it takes a large amount of people, a large amount of women to make these rights and these and this progress happen. And we're about to have that fight again in November with a, another election where it seems that the choice is between freedom and fascism and, and dictatorship and and democracy. I mean, I can't believe that in my lifetime that we have got to a point where we're having to, you know, fight the fight the fascism as my grandparents did in 1939. Do you mm -hmm. see what I mean? It's like, it is, it, it just blows my mind that here we are. And, and for you to have to take this fight on, despite all the progress that has been made, despite Roe being precedent for 50 years, it, it's a very, it's a very sad thing that we're having to do this and to the detriment of other things. I mean, climate change is on the back burner. Ukraine right. is on the back burner because we're having to deal with the 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 rise of fascism here in America, and it's come in the in the shape of a of a of a reality TV show host. You know, I mean, it's so weird. So let's let's just talk about you know how you give advice and how you encourage other people to understand that you know, to, to be a Democrat or to vote Democrat or even to be an independent who's going to mark Democrat in the in the polling place about the importance of that and, and what is at stake. I mean, how, how do you broach it? And, and have you had experience? I know you make the videos, of course, which are essential. But in real life, have you had to kind of have the talk with anybody? And how do you go about it? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head with fascism is at our doorstep and democracy is on the line. And I think people in this country take for granted the democracy that we have um, and the country that we have. And I think people in other countries don't do the same thing. And I'm not sure what the difference is. I think it's a little bit of American exceptionalism, thinking we're, you know, we have this form of government and we're kind of above and we're past um, the need to really think or care about our government. And that's just not true. Um, and so, I mean, the, the fight continues. And so I think it's just reminding people of that, that democracy is not guaranteed and we need to go out and vote and we can't even care about these other issues like climate change, which I mean, who cares about democracy if our world is on fire, yeah, right? I was going to say, it's like, we, we need somewhere to live, right? Right. So to me, I'm like, climate change seems like the most existential issue that we have and we can't even focus on it. We can't even pass legislation on it because we're fighting these Republicans to keep our, you know, our government in, in place and to keep our democracy in place. So it's frustrating. It's very frustrating. It feels regressive. It feels like, you know, and a lot of people don't even see the intensity or extremity of 
where we're at as a country. You know, they think it's just any other election and we have these two candidates and they're both the same and they're both old and they're both, you know, I've heard people on cable news saying they're both under investigation. I'm like, give me a break, you know? Yeah. Like one of them, Donald Trump has 91 pending charges against him and Joe Biden has zero. They're not both under investigation. We have a man who legitimately attempted to overthrow our government. So they are not the same, not even close. Um, and we need to be talking about how serious of a time this is, how important this election is. The people who still see Democrats as evil, which is something that I hear time and time again from the right, it's so it's just so weird to me that you can equate Democrats to being evil when they advocate for freedom for all, that you can do whatever you want to do, and it's fine. I mean, you know, when the Republican argument is you can't do this and you can't do that, you can't be free to practice your religion, you can't be free to be a, 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 an outward trans person, you can't be free to make the decision about your, you know, the, 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 the fetus in, inside of you. I mean, these are the fundamental freedoms that we have earned, that the country has earned, as you say, because of the sacrifice made by individuals and activists and people o over, over decades. So how do we qualify this, this freedom thing? You know, in, in Republican circles, when they claim to be the party of freedom, and in reality, they're anything but, how do you, how do you make that argument to people? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, like I said earlier, it's like, even if you're a Republican who's actively involved in the party, you can't critically criticize your own party because, because you think that the other side, the other side is evil. Um, and so, yes, they're banning books. Yes, they're preventing, you know, people from going in the bathroom <laughs> that they want to go in. Yeah. But to them, that's, it's, it, they, they think want, they're saving the country. Yes, exactly. Um, and so they have this vision of how the country should be and that's how they want it. And they don't care if they have to sacrifice certain freedoms to get it back to that place or this idealistic place that they have in their head because their party is the, the, the good party, the correct party. And it's like, they've made a deal with the devil. They think that, you know, even if Donald Trump overthrows the election, it's for the good of the country because yeah. their party will be in power when they need to say, okay, let me put the country first. Let me like, you know, we need, our democracy is more important than any one party being in power. Our freedoms are more important than any one party being in power. And just because it's your party doing it doesn't make it okay. Or right. Um, so and, and also Republicans are voting for Donald Trump, but Democrats are not voting for Joe Biden. They're voting for democracy. They're voting for, you know, the, 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 the policies that I would consider normal, which Americans tend to refer to as liberal, but they're just not. They're just normal. <laughs> and, you know, democracy should continue long after Joe Biden has left this planet. And, but Donald Trump doesn't really see it like that. You know, for him, he wants to be president forever. I mean, all of this stuff is just so reminiscent of, of these authoritarian countries, especially Russia and Vladimir Putin. And yet there is this still this denial that there was ever any, not just collusion, but any kind of support coming from Russia and Donald Trump's constant denials about, about Russia. And actually everything that he says is straight out of Putin's playbook. Totally. Um, yeah, I mean, he is a picture perfect narcissist. He, um, he has a lot of, you know, issues within himself that he needs to figure out. I don't think he ever will, but I mean, it's still baffling to me that this is who is the existential threat to our country. Is this, like you said, a reality TV host yeah. who has multiple failed businesses. He was born into money and hasn't really you know, achieved anything for himself, truly. I mean, but he's put on this persona and this, um, yeah, this mask that he is 
the epitome of the American dream and people just fell for it. And they, they take everything he says as fact. And it's to me, I'm like, he, half the time he's speaking at a fourth grade level. Like he doesn't even, you know, he's just saying anything that comes to his mind or any, like he, I don't know. It's like, it's so frustrating, honestly, because it's, he's not even a good villain. He's, you know, he's, yeah. He's a bad liar. He's a bad liar. And he's yeah. under, you know, he has, he's going to be in court this whole next year. And so, I don't know. I mean, it's just, there's some days where you just want to give up and you're like, you know, these people are just too far gone, but our country is too important to do that. And I think there are people who can be reached. And I think it's, it's imperative on us to show that Democrats are worthy of their vote and Joe Biden is worthy of their vote, um, and um, that it's better to have the enemy win than to lose the country altogether. Because I personally would rather see Nikki Haley win this nomination and go up against Joe Biden and Joe Biden run the risk of losing than have a minuscule chance of Donald Trump winning this presidency. I think the common knowledge in the party is that Donald Trump's the easier candidate to beat, but to me, the risk is not even worth it because I care too much about our country to even, you know, I would rather us lose fair and square and have to go from there and figure out how we as a party can improve than to run the risk of Donald Trump winning again. Because he will be much worse this time. He's oh, yeah. learned his lessons and his plan for America under his presidency is all about retribution and really doubling down on the things that he couldn't get done last time because there was you know some people with a with a moral compass in his in his orbit do you think that republican voters maga republicans or whatever you want to call people do you think they recognize how much hot water donald trump is in do you think that they know enough about the court cases do you think that there is enough coverage in conservative media now because like you say there are so many legal issues that he is facing do you think that that information is starting to filter through and that it might sway them because nobody wants to vote for somebody who has got you know multiple 91 charges four indictments and possibly more against him yeah i mean i hope so i think the mainstream media is doing a good job of covering each of his indictments i know it's it can be very convoluted for people to really understand what's going on. So I think the in the in, in the terms that we can if we can put it into layman's terms for people, then that's going to help us a lot. Um and so that's really what it's about is public perception of why is he going to trial? You know, what are the potential ramifications? It could he possibly go to jail? Like and the better we can do that, then I think um the better it is for us because a lot of times people hear, oh, well, conspiracy to commit fraud and civil fraud, you know, and and they just it goes over their head because it's like, OK, this, you know, who cares? We don't care. Um, or they just think that it's all a witch hunt and, you know, it's just a political prosecution. So, um, I mean, to me, it's more obvious than ever that Donald Trump is he's not a political candidate who's being prosecuted. He is a criminal who's being prosecuted, um, who happens to be running for office to potentially halt those prosecutions. And that's where we need to consistently message that is that he's not someone who's running for office who is being prosecuted, but he is truly someone who is running for office to avoid his prosecutions. Yeah. There was a CNN poll on Friday that gave Trump a four point lead over Joe Biden. Does it surprise you that despite all the coverage and despite Trump's behavior, you know, the kind of weird messaging that he's using now and obviously his the mistakes that he's making because, you know, he's confusing Nikki Haley, Nancy Pelosi, mul multiple things, actually. Does it surprise you that he is still doing so well? I mean, polls, as we know, we take with a pinch of salt, but it's still worthy of a conversation because in my mind, he shouldn't even feature in the poll. He should be down... You should have like 10% and that's it. But, you know, to be four points ahead is still concerning. Yeah. I mean, yes, it is surprising to me because I think that every time 
he has done something, he has committed another crime, you feel like, okay, this is the one that's really going to take him down, you know? And that just doesn't seem to be the case. It actually ends up more support for him. So, I mean, it's all contrary to, you know, historical knowledge of politics and how, like, what happens to politicians when they go through scandals or um, things like that. And it just, none of it makes any sense, to be quite honest. But that's who he is. He is, to me, the epitome of a cult leader. Everything he says gets taken for word by these people who want to believe him. And, yeah, it's frustrating. I mean, in a perfect world, he would be, you know, a private citizen who's potentially going to be in jail soon. And he's maybe holding the highest office again. It doesn't, I mean, yeah, it's not surprising. Um, or it is surprising, but it's also not surprising because um, there are these people that just, they just believe, I mean, they just, they put all their hope and their trust in him and they just believe and want to believe him. Because he doesn't care for the people that are putting their hope and trust in him. That's the problem, isn't it? That, no. that actually those, you know, that those MAGA supporters are not Trump's people. You know, he the people he likes to hang out with were the late Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, that's that's really? his people. It, it's it's such a it's such a kind of mismatch in terms of you know of, of leadership. I want to talk about you mentioned cult leader. I want to talk finally about the cult, the, the cult of Trump, as is described by Dr. Steve Hassan, who wrote the book, and he you know talks about undue influence and how people are brainwashed, and and you know Trump is very good at this, and and. Obviously, now there's this kind of messiah complex as well, where some people think that he is speaking the word of God and all that stuff. The, you were in the cult for a time, and you got out of the cult. And I think that this really is the, the, the crux of this conversation, isn't it? That, you know, what does it take for someone to get themselves out? Because you got yourself out. You know, someone didn't kind of come in and and pluck you or, you know, lead you out, I presume. You you had the intelligence and the strength to be able to, you know, in, in the face of so much propaganda and pressure, you managed to, to, to see the light. What would you say to cult members who are still very much embedded in Donald Trump worship, who are voting against their own interests ultimately, and would live a much freer and more inclusive life, you know, under a, a democratic president. Yeah, I mean, I made a video about talking to family members, and I think that's probably as far as you can get with trying to talk someone, talk a Trump supporter into, you know, leaving the cult or leaving the party, because your family might actually listen to you, right? Like, they trust you, they know you. And you may be able to sit down and have a real conversation with them. But I'm telling you, if I were, I mean, back when I was in the party, if someone tried to fight me or debate me, I, you know, my mind was not changing. I was, I was getting more steadfast in my views because that's how it is right now. You know, you get more firmly planted in your camp. And so I don't think any amount of like arguing or internet, you know, debates are going to change people's mind. I think it's up to them. At the end of the day, um, it was up to me and I decided that I didn't really like what was going on. I didn't, I didn't, you know, what I didn't like the direction that the party was going in. And so I opened myself up to differing views and I started getting my news from different places. And I started, you know, reading about different perspectives and reading books. And um, I think that's what it's going to take is to get people to want to do that for themselves. And, uh, um, I mean, it's tough. It's really tough because it is at the end of the day, it's, you know, everyone is autonomous and they can choose to sit and watch Fox News or watch Newsmax, you know, and they're going to, they're not going to, their minds aren't going to change. But if, if we can will them to open up their perspective and, and, you know, seek out different viewpoints, then we might be able to actually bring some people to our side. It takes work, doesn't it? I mean, that's what I'm getting from you is that you actually had to put the work in in order to see other views and, you know, we can be couch potatoes and we can just absorb the misinformation if we have Fox or Newsmax or one of these networks on and it's, it's fun, you know, it's, it's, it's like I, I describe American politics like blood sport and of course people are drawn to that. 
But, you know, politics should be boring and the work that it takes to actually really understand it, it can be tough sometimes. Just reading policy documents or just even looking at, you know, ideas outside of your information silo. Um, the, 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 The cult is still pretty strong and pretty powerful. I often struggle with the percentages. I'm like, so what percentage of Trump supporters are uh, that kind of extreme MAGA, you know, the people that buy the merchandise right. versus what percentage of Republicans as a whole does that make up, you know? And some people throw out numbers like it's 35% of the total electorate, but it's really only 20% of Republicans. W- what do you think in terms of numbers? Like what percentage of, of Republican voters do you think are really like hell-bent that Donald Trump is their man? That is tough. I mean, it's hard to say because I think that's what we're exposed to a lot on social media. And um, it feels bigger than it is. It feels bigger than it is. I do truly believe that. I think that we when we think of Republicans, we think of the diehard MAGA people, but really they're actually a smaller percentage than you might think. And I do think the majority of our population, as sad as it is, just isn't truly politically inclined. Um, We have a lot of low information voters that go and vote based off of political party or vote based off of anecdotes or just, you know, perceptions they have about the candidate or the party. Not a lot of it is based in policy, you know, and it would take a lot of interest for those people to want to read about policies, want to see where, um, you know, the positives and the pros are coming into play throughout the country when things like the infrastructure bill are passed. And that just that truly just takes interest in the topic and the matter. And a lot of people don't have that. You know, they are more interested in sports. They're interested in movies they are interested in their day to day life. And so um, I think, yeah, I mean, I do think that the the MAGA crowd is smaller and I do think it's dying and it's dwindling down, um, which is a good thing. But it's up to us to reach those other people um, and meet them where they're at. and. It doesn't take a whole lot. You know, we don't have to shove the 50 page legislative document in their face. We have to reach them with anecdotes. We have to reach them with things that resonate with them. And with kindness as well, because, you know, I'm of the opinion that actually we're all the same and we all want the same things. And and nobody wants an invasion at the southern border. Right. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants a. Uh, you know, an immigration crisis, as it's being described. It actually isn't that at all. But that's how it's been. It's been branded. I think that if Republicans knew that under Joe Biden that they'd detained or arrested or deported more migrants than Donald Trump did in his four years, then they might be like, oh, but no one seems to be talking about that, which is a, a little strange to me. Yeah. And that and that actually when it comes to, you know, wanting the country, you know, to be to be a patriot, that everybody wants the same thing and that actually we're not so different and we're all you know, of the of the same race, we're all of the human race. We have that in common, and so do you. Th- do you think that there is a way to communicate with with Republicans? Because it's you know, there's not that much time, right? There's like ten months to really kind of get people to understand that you know what needs to happen to Donald Trump between now and November for people to be like, okay, I'm out, I'm done. You know, it's like. Because it looks like the the you know the Stormy Daniels hush money case is going to be the first one that's going to going to be heard. Mm-hmm. It might be the only one that's heard before the election. I mean, is that enough to make people recognize that you know paying off a porn star is not something that a president should be doing and and and, and should certainly not be proud of? I mean, do you think that any of these legal issues are enough between now and November to make people go, okay, I've had enough of this guy? Yeah, I do. Um, Again, I think it's up to like how we push the narrative and how we're talking about the cases. And if we can bring it to people where they're at and and deliver it to them in layman's terms, then I think that it can um, influence public perception. But if we're getting too in in the weeds again, people kind of just, you know, they don't care. They don't they don't want to hear about it. And I think that's true for policies, like I said. And um, on the topic of immigration, I think it's important for us to take back that narrative of um, illegal immigration. I think a lot of times as a party, we shy away from those topics because we don't want to um, 
you know, burn the support of a certain side of the party. But I think that we need to reclaim it. And the, and the less we talk about it, the more Republicans talk about it, right. If you know, and then vice versa. So the more they talk about it, we we stay quieter and then they keep talking about it and they're controlling the entire narrative around it. And um, I mean, you could see that we're kind of doing that on the topic of abortion. We have taken that narrative and controlled it. And so they're losing on that topic. So we need to continue to do that. Um, and we can't let them, you know, dominate. Oh, we're the the border security party. Um, because when Republicans see, oh, like this is the only side that's talking about this issue and I care about this issue, I'm going to vote for this side. They need to see whether you have policy differences and Joe Biden's plan is different from, you know, Mike Johnson's plan, which I'm sure it is. But um, we can't be sitting back and, and silent on these issues. Yeah. Well, there is a, there is a, a small change recently in that is that Joe Biden is saying, I will shut the border. So he's actually starting to use yeah. some of this language. That's great. And, and the thing is, you know, Democrats are not all the same, right? They, 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 they don't chant phrases like build the wall or lock her up. You know, it's, it's not really a kind of progressive thinking doesn't work in that kind of cult-like way. And so it will be hard for Joe Biden to please all Democrats all of the time. It's just not going to happen. But I think that if there's enough debate and, and the application of critical thinking, then people, you know, make concessions and they make allowances and, and they recognize that, you know, in the long run, you're better off with somebody who advocates for true democracy than somebody that is openly admitting that they're going to be a dictator and that, you know, they're going to, for one day or otherwise, that, and especially with his form, you know, because I remember those four Trump years, the worst, the most terrible, terrible time for people in the U.S. And and I think people will have short memories about about that. Just finally, the, you know, the midterms were, the, the Republicans didn't do as well in the midterms as they were thinking they were mm-hmm. going to, right? There was all talk of this red wave and all this stuff. And, and it turned out that actually a woman's right to choose was really one of the kind of hot button issues that meant that Democrats actually did very well. Do you feel, as I do, and I think, and as Joe Biden feels, that that November this year is also going to, you know, that, that the abortion debate is going to feature probably more than than anything else. I do think that's where they're planning on focusing their their time and effort because I think it worked in twenty twenty two. And it was also immediately after the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So yeah. it was fresh on people's minds. And I think it's important for us to keep talking about that because, like you just said, people have short memories. And so it's been four years since Donald Trump was president. They do forget certain things that he did or how he acted or how they felt during that time. And so, again, it's up to us to continue to remind them and to paint the picture of what, you know, a second term with him would actually look like. And um, yeah, I mean, and, and to double down on these issues, these critical issues, because I think people, they know, okay, Roe v. Wade got overturned and then they move on and they kind of forget and, um, until it impacts them personally. And then, yeah. well, men, men might forget, but, but women are reminded every month. And, uh, if yeah. not, they're thinking about it every day. And, yeah. and I think that this is the thing, isn't it? In fact, there were quite a lot of Republican men who are heard after Roe was overturned saying, right, well, that's that done now. You know, it's not, we don't have to think about that issue anymore. And it's like, I think you're ignoring the women in this country yeah. um, on on both sides. You know, Republicans need abortions too. Um, okay, we have to finish. But listen, I'm I'm so impressed and, and genuinely proud of your work, your activism and the way that you handle yourself. And I, and I think, I only hope that there are more people like you who can you know, see the world outside of the United States, because, you know, that's where I get my inspiration. And I think that we sometimes forget that there is, there are, you know, plenty of other countries who've worked all this stuff out and are living harmoniously. So Ali Samarco, thank you for joining The Weekend Show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Download the 5-Minute News podcast and 
Don't forget to join me next week with a brand new special guest and more factual stories to discuss on the 5-Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch. <laughs>